welcome back! In this episode, we return to the Great Herdsman to nab its second Munro, Stopnabrogia, before taking on the two Munros of Buchelyet of Beag, Stopkurrenich and Stopdu. Along the way, we'll explore the dramatic path of Glencoe and its spectacular viewpoint known as the Study, find out just who the Ralston Memorial honours, and continue the story of the Glencoe Massacre with a look at the denizens of the Glen, Clan McKeon, the McDonald's of Glencoe. If you find yourself enjoying the show, hitting like and subscribing really helps the channel to grow and to create more free content like this for you to enjoy. Seen from Glen Etiv, Stopna Brogia is an imposing buttress of stone rising out of the glen that caps the Big Bacillia's southern extremity with an excellent viewpoint to the surrounding landscape. It's most often ascended via the winding ridge from Stop Jerich, but can also be easily accessed via the Larig Garten. The path from Bielach Natulich runs over point 902 and around the rim of the Curaclirch of Vinya to the steep north ridge of Stopnadora. In summer, it's a stony but negotiable walk with a phenomenal panorama to either side, and a more gently angled ridge drops south to the Bialich below Stopkuraltrum, where the standalone route joins the crest. Those unenamoured with the prospect of a traverse over stony Stopnadora may wish to access Stopnabrogia via Cura Altrum, which, while requiring a very brief scramble, is extremely easy fare relative to Cura Natulis. To reach Cura Altrum via the Larig Garten, start at a busy lay-by below Nocknam Boken, just around the corner from Altna Fey, and follow the signposted path up the Larig Garten. This runs beside the nascent River Kupel to a junction where the Cora Altrim path branches off downwards to cross the river and starts to wind its way up into the lower tier of Cora Altrim. The difficulty here, a short rock step that barely makes scrambling grade 1, is encountered very early on so there's no exposure, but given the terrain, care should be taken if the rock is wet, as technically a slip here could still result in serious injury. Beyond this lie no further obstacles except the unrelenting gradient, but the grassy hillside eventually relents and deposits you upon the ridge crest, where a short ascent leads to Stop Cora Altrum. From here, it's an easy scamper to the summit of Stopnabrogia, a double-topped plateau with exceptional views in all directions. Like its larger sibling to the east, Buchelietiv Beg, the little herdsman of Etiv, is another ridge of several tops presenting an impressive, if smaller, northern facade to Glencoe. It runs parallel to the greatest herdsman, straddling the glens of Etiv and Coe and dividing the Larig's Garten and Eltje with absolutely incredible views from all three of its summits. The standard route for Berkeley of Beag starts from a lay-by on the A82 shortly before the study and next to a popular waterfall, rising gently to a junction where the Larig Eltje path drops away to the other side of the valley and the Munro path branches off to the left to rise steeply up a prominent grassy rib. Excellent all the way up, this path will punish the thighs but allows for rapid height gain. Once upon the Bialik, it's just a case of picking which Munro you want to do first. We recommend doing Stopkurrenich first as it's quickest and an easy 150 metres ascent. Once back on the Bialik, it's an easy climb to point 902 then a short but incredibly spectacular ridge traverse to the dramatic pyramidal peak of Stop Du. This offers an unobstructed viewpoint straight down Glen Etiv and sensational vistas across to the Etiv range, Bityan Nambayan and Ernich Eich. Trust us, you want to do these ones on a clear day. Remember, in winter the Scottish mountains are as severe as the Alps, 
and easy summer routes can become challenging and demanding mountaineering expeditions. Do not attempt any mountain in winter without experience of using crampons, ice axe and compass bearings. Mountaineering is a dangerous and potentially life-threatening activity that should not be taken lightly. Watching YouTube videos is a great way to get inspired, but it does not in any way prepare you for the reality of mountaineering. The Scottish mountains are beautiful, but demand respect. Be bold, be safe. Hello again. Here we are in the Lara Garten, the Pass of the Ticks, on our way to Bag Stopna Brogia up there. And the Stopkur Altrum is facing us. Now, uh, basically making our way along the bottom of the Lara Garten here uh, to that little uh, hillocky bit there where we'll cross the river and hit the Munro Pass. Well, here we are approaching the crossing over the river and you can see the route uh, such as it is up there. Um, there's a little bit of scrambling just there about one third of the way up. Um, but it's nothing as bad as Kurtulish and there's uh, about as much exposure as on the side of a curb. Well, we're starting to gain some height above the Lara Garten and uh, basically following the path of this stream up here, which would be the Alt Kur Altrim, I presume. Now, um, once we're up the top of this glistening stream part here, um, we take a right hand turn up into the upper reaches of Kur Altrim and from there to the ridge itself. The main difficulty is the heat at the moment. It's like a furnace up here and there's almost no wind at all. So yeah, sweating it out today. Hot as hell in here. Yeah, man, but it's a dry heat. Knock it off, Hudson. Well, here we are approaching the steepening. There's a, a modest rock band crossing the quarry here which we'll uh, negotiate with the help of this excellent path, which as you can see, nice uh, staircase of stones again. Marvellous work by the National Trust for Scotland going on up here. Well, here we are at the scrambly bit, and uh, as you can see, it only just kind of qualifies as a scramble. You'll need, need your hands here and there, but uh, it's not exactly uh, north face of the Eiger territory really, is it? Once we're over here, that's the crux of this quarry, and then we've got a slog up a grass slope up onto the ridge. How hard can it be, right? Well, 
That's the quote scary bit over and uh, it's not very scary, spoiler alert. Um, the only time it would give you a bit of difficulty I think would be if it was wet like after a heavy rain or something like that. As it was, it's a piece of cake. Onward to the Bialik. Well, here we are in the exit gully of Kuraltrum. Looking back down, there's a lot of garden down there. You can see over to the grey corries and the black corries over there too. And uh, yeah, I'll be glad to get onto this Bialik. I'll see you up there. Well, rarely have I been so glad to reach the Bialik. Jeez, it is some heat. Stop Nadora over there looking magnificent and uh, entirely too steep for my liking on, in this, this heat. So thankfully, Stop Nabrogia, the one we're going for, is nothing like that. Uh, we've just got to head to the top of Stop Kuraltrum up here and then it's a ridge walk along to the peak of the boot. Oh yeah, nice. Looking down to Ben Starov. Loch Etif. Beautiful, huh? There's our objective. Awesome visibility over there to Nevis and the Grey Corries. Marvellous. Oh yeah, bitch and Nam Bain over there. Look at that for a massif. You got uh, Scornahule over there, uh, Ben Henley, and uh, over there, Stop Nabrogia, the last level. Let's head on over there. Well, it can't be a nice, relatively level stroll along the ridge after a strenuous ascent like that out of Coraltrum. Now, uh, there it is, the final leg. Not too tricky at all, is it? The spectacular views all around, as you can see. You can see the, the ridge narrows a little bit here. It's before broadening out again for the slope up to the top of Stop Nabrogia. Now I've got to tell you this has been some getting to this peak. <laughs> it was only added to the tables in 1997. Um, again it's one of those stumpers where you're like mm, how, how is this 
the Munro and stop my daughter over there. <laughs> it's like, no, you don't want to. Okay, fair enough. It's ours not to reason why. The Munro classifications. Now, uh, up here, we're going to get a smashing view down into Glen Etiv. So without further ado, let's smash on up there. And here it is, complete with wind shelter, which uh, we certainly don't need today, but uh, it might give us a nice bit of shade. Yeah, here we are. The other end of the big Buchilia, the greatest herdsman. Stop Nabrogia, peak of the boot. And uh, it has been somewhat of a boot camp getting up here in this crazy heat that unfortunately isn't so crazy these days. It seems to be <coughs> getting more and more regular, but uh, hey, it gives us amazing mountain days like this, so can't really moan too much. The magnificence of the Loch Aber Munros. And uh, looking over there, the expanse of Rannoch Moor. You can see uh, Srona Kreja and Kreja, Clach Laird. And right down there, you can see the giant twins of Crean Larich, uh, Ben Moore and Stop Vinian. Stop Gavar, the giant there. And we've got the hills of Glen Etiv here. And uh, in the far distance, you can see the ridge of Ben Kruiken. Now here you can see over into Appin, the Munros of Appin. Skorna Hule over there. Got Ben Hinley. And over there, Ben Schoolard, that long ridge. Beyond that, you can see over to Mull. And it really is smashing visibility today. Yo, here we are, back in the glen, to take on the wee Buchilia. Stop Kurrenich, behind Stop Nan Kavar there, and uh, Stop Du, the Black Peak. 
Now to reach it, we're going to head along here, down to a little place called the Study, which kind of marks the start of the Pass of Glencoe. Now behind me here you can see the Three Sisters of Bitchin Nambian. Big massive one over there is Enoch Du, the Black Ridge. Well, Gjør Enoch, in between it there, the slightly more diminutive one. And uh, the one closest to us here has been Hada. After the Jacobite defeat of 1746, a new military road was built passing the eastern end of Glencoe, and in 1785, the first road was built through the Glen itself. The clearances took their toll in Glencoe, and by the death of the 17th chief, Ewan MacDonald, in 1837, the chieftainship of the MacDonalds itself had very little meaning. Ownership of Glencoe passed through several hands during the next century, and in 1935, to prevent possible commercial exploitation, the National Trust for Scotland bought 12,800 acres of the Glen. With the help of donations from a variety of sources, the Trust's holding has been extended over the years and today covers most of the Glen from the edge of Rannochmore to the shores of Loch Leven. Obviously this is a really, really popular part of the world. Uh, this drive in itself is uh, pretty much universally recognised as being one of the most scenic on the earth. Um, so, the world and his wife will descend upon any and every parking spot. And the place back there, uh, for the Lara Garten, uh, <laughs> that was pretty much fit to burst and it's about 20 to 30 cars there. Uh, so, yeah. You don't get much peace and quiet unless you uh, venture off the beaten track in Glencoe, which of course is our forte. And here, the road begins to kind of narrow a bit and uh, you've got these crash barriers on either side which makes it a bit dangerous to walk along. So, we're going to follow the Thomas Telford Road here towards the study and uh, take a wee branch off and cross the very, very low river, uh, River Coe. It's running between that and the start of our path. So without further ado, let's head on down there. And there's our path. You can see some people making their way up it already. You can see that sizeable cairn down there, uh, which we'll see when we get to it what that is. Now that's a cairn and a half. What do we reckon this symbolises? A memorial to the 1692 massacre perhaps? Built untold hundreds of years in the past? Well, no. In fact, it was built in the year 1993, and it's based on a previously destroyed plinth used as a coffin rock. Contrary to pseudo-historical accounts regarding Queen Victoria, this has no commemorative significance other than being a place on which coffins were rested during funereal processions from Glen Etive to the burial ground on Yellen Munda, an islet off the south shore of Loch Leven. Simply placing the coffin on the ground during transport would have been a massive no-no for those of pagan belief. Only when lowered into the grave should the body actually meet the earth. This meant some seriously sore arms on the part of the bearers, and thus the need for a plinth, or link, on which to rest the sacred cargo appropriately. It was purposefully destroyed in the 18th century by government soldiers building the old military road, because of course it was, but restored by the NTS in 1993, supposedly to its original shape and appearance. However, unless the coffins were borne by the giant Fane themselves, this restoration seems to have somewhat exaggerated the cairn's height.
Well, and here we are on the path itself, having just turned off um, <clears throat> from the main footpath through uh, the Larig Iltje. And uh, up here, you can see some people making their way up this kind of grassy rib up there, up to the Bialik from where there's still a fairly steep climb to both of the Munros on each side. Similar to that of the Big Buchilia, the path up here is absolutely perfect. We've got some nice staircasey bits here and uh, it's just dry, rubbly, just what you want from a Munro path, especially in such boggy terrain as this. Obviously the NTS have been busy up here, uh, not just laying the path, but uh, laying drainage as well, kind of pipes, uh, various things to keep, keep the water off the path, which is always uh, very much appreciated. You can see the route becoming more pronounced now. Some people almost at the top of it there, just uh, reaching towards the Bialik. It's a lovely day. Let's head on up there. Well, this path certainly doesn't take any prisoners. As you can see, it's a pretty direct staircase up this uh, spur here. <clears throat> We're about 500 meter mark, and uh, you can see the Bialik up there. So without further ado, let's get cracking. Well, over there you can see the National Trust for Scotland sign declares this to be the start of Glencoe proper. Now the reason for that is behind it on the hillside there. You can see up in that gully, that's where the River Coe begins. And uh, indeed it flows under the road here. Yeah, there's a little bridge and uh, <coughs> continues down there into Glencoe towards Loch Achtirchten and uh, onwards towards Loch Leven. Scenic or what? And just before the bridge over the nascent River Coe, the old Telford Road turns off here towards the study, the pass of Glencoe and the meeting of the three waters. One of the most scenic parts of the Glen. So let's head along and check it out. Well, here we are descending towards the path of Glencoe. You can see it narrowing there <clears throat> at that rock cut, which has indeed been cut from the rock. Now, hang on a minute. Surely Thomas Telford in the 19th century wouldn't have been using TNT <clears throat> to build his road. No, indeed. Uh, the blasting and the, the carving of the road uh, through the narrowest section here actually occurred in the 1930s. This is part of the reason it's so scenic and uh, so exciting to drive along. Uh, you have these massive wide open vistas and suddenly you're hemmed in by walls of rock. As for us, our road continues on the north side of the main road here, along towards the study. Now, why is it called the study? It seems a bit of a strange name. And indeed, it's not Gaelic. Well done. Again, this is a modern day descriptor given by Anglophones who couldn't be bothered learning Gaelic words. The meaning of the English name is disappointingly prosaic. In Victorian times, the location was a popular spot for an artist to set up their easel and paint an impression or study of the landscape to the west. Its real name is Inyan Nashech, Anvil of the Mist. Now obviously, such a stunning backdrop lends itself particularly well to celluloid. 
in films such as Rob Roy, Highlander and The 39 Steps, as well as many more, have been filmed along this stretch of path and indeed at the study itself. Yeah boy, as promised, the view down into Glencoe itself and uh, as mentioned this was the inhabited part of Glencoe traditionally. You can see a nice flat floodplain down there to graze your cattle on. Significantly lower as you can see than uh, the entrance or the lobby of uh, Alt Nafe and uh, the Buchelia. Just around the corner there you'll find Loch Achtriochten. Now behind me is, uh, apart from this giant cairn which denotes the study, uh, the viewpoint itself, up there the eagle-eyed will spot a little bothy type uh, shelter and I've got a feeling there'll be an even better view up there. So let's head up and do an investigate. Hidden from the hordes behind a small grassy knoll, this is about as spectacular a garden of remembrance as you can get. The cairn is in memory of Ralston Clout Muir, a train driver on the West Highland Line and a keen mountaineer who loved scaling the crags of Glencoe. Ralston tragically died at the age of 32 from a rare and undiagnosed form of leukaemia, passing away on the 10th of January in the year 2000, very suddenly after taking on well on Christmas Day. His brother Trevor says that Ralston would have loved the fact that the Cairns location has brought so much attention to Glencoe and now enjoys such photographic popularity, perpetuating his memory with every new image taken. Ralston is often joined by his old friends who still visit the Cairn and have a wee dram with him in celebration of his life. It's unclear when the tiny shelter up here was built, but we can speculate based on what we know. Given its size and uh, location, it's kind of difficult to see how this could have been a shealing in the time of the Gaeltich. Um, more likely, it was probably some kind of lookout post uh, to keep an eye on who was entering the glen from the east there. Noticeable lack of windows, even the tiny little windows that the Clacken houses had. And uh, yeah, it looks like a bit of a bomb shelter, more than a, <laughs> more than a bothy, doesn't it? However, I guess it would need to be to survive, uh, if you were to survive up here in the winter months. It's not immediately apparent when arriving at the study from the east, but from the west, the viewpoint is situated atop a large rock prominence rising directly from the roadside to meet the old military road on top, and as such, it resembles a huge flat-topped slab when viewed from lower in the glen. This is where the anvil part comes from. Not only did it look like an anvil, Gales would have thought that it had been deliberately forged. Such dramatic rock structures were of great significance to the Gaeltich because, given their pagan belief, it's likely that they saw the stone tables as having been provided by the spirits of the earth for use by humans to practice fire worship, human sacrifice or rock concerts, delete as appropriate.
Well, the path has thankfully started to level out a little. <laughs> um, yeah, not quite so taxing on the knees, this final bit. About 600 metres now. The wind's uh, getting up a little bit as we gain some height, so it's not quite so swelteringly hot as it was lower down. Approaching the Bielik here, and the views westward are just incredible. Pitching Nambian in particular, showing its incredible size and complexity. And you can see uh, two of its tops there, Stop Kurskrevich, and that one, that must be Bitchin Nambian, right? No. <laughs> Bitchin Nambian, it hides itself uh, particularly well behind its flanks of stone. That one is Stop Kurnan Lokin. Uh, which used to be a Munro and is no longer. Now, Stopakur Skrevich has taken its place in the list. Here we are on the Bialik, and uh, holy moly, the gigantic extent of Burkle yet of more here. So you stop Jerag there, stop Nadora, stop Kuraltrim, and stop Nabrogia. The size of it. Speaking of which, the sizable cairn here as well. And uh, you can see the nice slab of granite pavement up here as well. Oh yeah, I get a wee bit of a breeze. So uh, shouldn't be too bad. Heading up there to stop Kur Rainish. Onward. There are two ways up to the Bialik in between the Munros the excellent Baggers Path from Glencoe, or a steeper, scrappier path from the Larig Garten. We can't really recommend the latter, as the views are markedly inferior to those seen on the standard route, and the, quote, path would test the patience of St. Colum Killa himself in anything but fine weather. Yeah, about halfway up, uh, stop Kurrena here. Smashing views down to Loch Etiv there, you can see. Ben Starov, of course. Uh, Bitchin Nambain is showing its full spread there. You can see the summit. You can see stop Kuran Lochin and stop a Kur Skrebich. Spectacular, isn't it? Not too far to go to the summit now. Let's head on up there. Well, very stony finish to this one. Not quite as steep as that of Ben Kruiken, but the same sort of terrain. Marvellous views. Look at that. Oofed. All the way down to the Glenetive range, Loch Etiv, looking stunning. Over there, fantastic visibility all the way down to Creed Larrick and uh, Cruer Cardron there.
and here we are, the summit of Stopkur Vrenich. Yowzer, 360 degree oofed again. We're there at Rannoch Moor, and uh, yeah, views just get more impressive. Yeah. There we go, the Big Ben. Grey quarries, black quarries, black water reservoir there. The giant Shehalion over there in the distance. Stop Jerak, of course. You can see quite a few of the Southern Highland peaks there as well. Stop Curran Albanach, displaying loads of that uh, Etiv granite on its sides there. And all the way down to our old friend Ben Kruik in there in the distance. Over here, you can see Loch Leven. And the Ernich Eich just gets more splendid the higher up you get, doesn't it? But yeah. 925 meters. Abbott. Here we are on the slopes of point 902 on our way to stop do. I'm a poet and I don't know it. Much more a substantial path <coughs> than that of stop Kurenich. The reason for that being that uh, stop do is uh, an OG Munro, whereas stop Kurenich over there is a far newer addition. Therefore, the path is a little more scrappy, but it's not too bad to be honest as they go. Bitchin Nambian over there, King of the Hills. And uh, you can see a couple of people just there up on the summit of point 902, so as you can see, not too far. Onward. Well, it's been a very pleasant stroll along this ridge and here we're about to reach the final level. Not quite as narrow as it looks and uh, as I say the final pull up there, not too steep. Up to that airy summit and just you wait till you see the views. Let's do it.
Oh shit, son. Here we are. The absolutely splendiferous summit of Stop Do, the Black Peak. Holy moly. Well, 10 out of 10 for drama and spectacle up here. There's so many peaks that you can see today that it would take me about half an hour to point them all out to you. <laughs> Uh, obviously the Queen of the South there looking absolutely stunning. Ben Lurie there. Uh, we've got the Glenetive range over here. Stop Gavar, Goliath there. You can see the size of it. All of that expanse is Stop Gavar. All of this stuff here. Stop Gavar there and uh, Stop a Coureur. Crasia, slightly closer to us here. And uh, Clach Laid, that pointy bit there. Obviously, we've got Stop Jerig here. Ranach Moor looking over to uh, Black Grey Corries and Eunuch uh, Moor. Ben Nevis, of course. Con Moor You can see the hills of the Ring of Stale in the, in the foreground there as well. Absolutely cracking vids today. It's just sublime. You don't get days like this very often, as we know. <laughs> Looking over there, you can see the peaks of Appen, which will be taken on shortly in the series. You can see Ben Schullard down there, that kind of long ridge. And uh, Ben Henley, this kind of uh, side on one. And uh, Skurnahuli over there, the lost peak of Glencoe, which I've actually climbed before, uh, but we will be doing it, of course. For the benefit of you guys out there. Bitch and Nambain and the hills of the West Highlands stretching away into the distance. Smashing. Huzzah! The second of our dynamic duel. Now I'm gonna head out along there because between you and me there's a secret along there that I can't wait to show you. So let's check it out.
The McDonald's of Lochaber collected many descriptors during the age of the forays, and a few of them complimentary. According to those with a dislike for them, and this was the vast majority of recorded commentary, they were a sept of thieves, wild, broken men living in miserable squalor, who indiscriminately murdered and plundered the lands of anyone unlucky enough to reside within range of their savage raiding parties. In the moneyed, prosperous lowlands, they were the devil incarnate, Visigoths at the gates of Rome, barbarian hordes to whom discourse meant chopping off parts of your body until you stopped talking. They were the herd Widifus, the gallows herd. But how did these kin of the Lords of the Isles fall into such low esteem? Were they really as bad as it was made out by the Sassanacs of the Lowlands and their out-of-touch English cronies? Well, let's just say that these claims are not, as we'll see, entirely without merit, but the McDonald's were also cynically misrepresented by the Scottish establishment and labelled as political insurrectionists, a charge that was, as we'll see, a bit of a stretch. The McDonald's of Glencoe saw themselves as nobles in the line of Somerled, Rannell and Donal, continuing the fight against those who sought to control the Gallic Highlands from a lowland throne. However, in their staunch and unwavering support for the Stuart kings, they unwittingly aligned themselves within the crosshairs of far more powerful and nefarious interests than the Scottish monarchy. A decision that would ultimately cost them a lot more than their reputation. It's time to make a foray of our own through Glencoe to discover just who the McKeans really were. The translation of Glencoe as Glen of Dogs comes from the ancient legend that cites it as a hunting ground of Fingal, leader of a mythical race of Celtic giants called the Fane, who, according to legend, possessed superhuman size and strength. The Hounds of Finn were said to inhabit the Glen still, guarding over his descendants from the ramparts of Mjöl Jerek and Bichin Nambian. Just for clarity, in Gallic culture, Finn is Fingal, and the Fane are the race of giants that he led. Like the Kaliach we learned about in Over the Wall, these Fane were ancient Gallic demigods who could alter the landscape on a whim and fight off the enemies of the Celts, such as the Vikings. Those who've seen our Glen Lion adventure in Twin Peaks will remember the saying, Finn built twelve castles in the crooked Glen of the Stones, referring to the ruined towers along Glen Lion. According to legend, Finn even cleaved the stone now known as the Praying Hands with an arrow. In Glencoe, Skurnam Fenne, Peak of the Fane, bears the name of these mythological superheroes. The lands of Glen Lyon and Bredalbin, through Rannach and Glencoe itself, were seen by the Gaeltic as the ancient domain of Fingal and the Fane, and therefore the land of the Gaeltic by right. The acquisition of said lands by the Sassanach English-speaking Campbells of Argyll was an intolerable insult to the Macdonalds, who still regarded themselves as the custodians of Highland Celtic tradition and culture. Glencoe was the smallest branch of Clan Donald. Before 1308, the Glen belonged to the Macdougalls of Lorne, but as we saw in the Hollow Mountain, in that year the Macdougalls fell foul of Robert the Bruce at the Pass of Brander and lost their lands to his allies, which included the Macdonalds and relatively new kids on the block, the Campbells of Loch Awe, as a result. Glencoe was among the fiefdoms bestowed upon Angus Og Macdonald, young Angus, in return for his service at Bannockburn. Angus's son, Jan Nanaila, or John of Isla, was made the first Lord of the Isles in the early 14th century, presiding over a sizeable Gallic domain in the west known as the Riech Nanyelen. Angus Og gifted Glencoe to his illegitimate son Jan Og Nan Frech, or Young John of the Heather, also known as Jan Abrech, or John of Loch Aber, 
and it's from this, Ian, that the McDonald's in Glencoe are descended. In honour of their progenitor, they thereafter called themselves Machian, or the children of Ian. To be clear, this was a descriptor and not a proper name. For example, individuals bore the surname MacDonald, but to avoid confusion, the chief of the Glencoe branch was referred to as Machian and his family as the Machians. Now, in Gallic culture, this would make it simpler to understand, but to Anglophones, the subtleties of clan nomenclature can seem incomprehensible. Are they Machians or Macdonalds? Well, both. They're Macdonalds who call themselves Machians. If you get confused, and to be honest, it's difficult not to, Machian equals Macdonald living in Glencoe. The surrounding Macdonalds in Loch Aber are referred to by their geographical locations, for example, Macdonald of Keppoch or Macdonald of Glengarry. The Macians lived in small townships along the River Coen, from Achtreachtan in the east to Achnamberg below the Three Sisters, the heavily populated area of Glenliechnamuye, the Valley of Slate and Churn, then northward to Achnacona, Wooded Lycantium, in Verigan, the chief's house at Carnach, which is roughly where the Glencoe village now stands, and the hamlet of Brecklet and Larach, now known as Balahulish. Macians were easily distinguished by their dress, that is, tartan trues and plaid instead of the plain brown kilts of common folk, or as the Macdonalds would see them, lesser clans. The Macians' tartan bonnets were adorned with a sprig of heather, representing their progenitor, Jan Ognan Frech. This tradition is unwittingly continued by any hillwalker who's dropped their hat on an approach path. A contemporaneous MacDonald bard of Glencoe, who apparently needed to brush up on his basic zoology, described Macian as like a peacock's tail in his splendour like a serpent's sting in his power to destroy. The Machians grazed sheep, goats, horses and garran, the diminutive yet capable highland pony, on the wide valley of Glenlechnamuye and the plains below Bichinambean, but of course their main source of income, sustenance and status were the prized ba or cattle. These would be taken to the shielings of the Black Mount between Savane and Beltane, the pagan rituals denoting the beginning and end of the summer season, to graze on the lush pastures of Rannach while the home fields recovered. But hang on a second, weren't the Gaels Catholics? What are they doing practicing pagan rituals? Well, pagan myths such as the Kaliak and the Fane were retained by Highlanders despite the arrival of Christianity with St. Columba et al. Gaels did not see them as binary opposites, and simply amalgamated the two, much to the horror of southern observers. As we saw at Drumlicher, the menfolk of the Glen would often be called upon in service of the chief for any manner of tasks, including combat operations. The signal rock near Achnacona had a fire set upon it to provide such summons to the folk at the east end of the glen, and it's highly likely it's seen use since ancient times at the aforementioned fire rituals in spring and autumn. Taxmen, or heads of rent-paying families in the Glen, were cousins of Macian, thus descendants of Ian Abrach and his father Angus Og. Those of such lineage were Dun Yuzel, or men of honour. This is the principle by which the taxmen assumed the name of their progenitor. In Highland society, blood and honour were the ultimate symbols of status. As seen in Fallen Kingdom, the MacDonald Lordship of the Isles brought nearly 200 years of relative order and stability to the Highlands, and as a result, the Macians effectively disappear from history in this time, safe in their mountainous fortress with their immensely powerful kin supporting them in arms and wealth. Like many small clans at this time, the Macians lived in relative peace with their neighbours, and the Highland Honour Code of Communal Pasture, Community Spirit, 
and universal hospitality promoted collaboration and independence among the Gaeltech. Eventually, the Macdonalds gave the Stuart kings the excuse that they needed to forfeit their titles and lands. Said lands were then given to those friendly to the crown, and in the case of Glencoe, this was Duncan Stuart of Appin. In an unusually charitable concession, however, the McKeans were acknowledged by the crown as possessors of Glencoe, as long as they paid the rent. <laughs> to the McKeans, such galling patronisation was preferable to eviction, and to McKeon's taxmen, it really made little material difference. In the 1540s, the reign of Mary, Queen of Scots, saw the Stuarts of Appin fall from grace to the benefit of the Earl of Argyll, Archibald Campbell, who we met in Rise of the Campbells. Campbell became feudal superior to Duncan Stuart, and thus now owned Glencoe. I got a bad feeling about this. As seen in previous episodes, the Macdonald Campbell conflict, all too often presented as a mindless blood feud, was ultimately for the control of the Gaeltech, or more accurately in the case of the Campbells, control of the land and resources of the Gaeltech. Every disagreement, skirmish and battle between these two families, every proxy conflict, every double dealing alliance with neighbouring clans was rooted at the most fundamental level in this bitter rivalry. In series one, we learned how the Campbells attempted the wholesale genocide of MacGregors in Bredalbin and Glen Lyon, using their power as royal lieutenants to execute anyone bearing the name and forfeiting, that is stealing, their lands in the name of the crown. Had Glencoe been as valuable or accessible as Glen Lyon, just such a fate would likely have also befallen the McKeons. The first Campbell operation against the McKeons of Glencoe had come in 1500, when a contingent from Glen Etive breached Glencoe via the Larig Eltje, with the aim of capturing John of the Islas, otherwise Abrachson, by which they meant the McKeon chief, or son of Abrach. They didn't get very far with this plan, and the sons of Abrach promptly returned the favour by venturing south to Loch Awe, and breaking the captive Donald Dhu, or Black Donald, heir to the Lordship of the Isles, free from the Campbell Castle on Ennis Connell. This made it clear to all watching where their allegiance lay, that is, with their forebears, the old Kings of the West, and showed that the McKeans did not fear the Sassanach Campbell pretenders and their naked aspirations to wealth and power. Henceforth, the McKeans isolated themselves from the outside world behind the walls of Urnach Eich and Bitchin Nambean, venturing forth only in search of ba, or cattle, to steal. We'll get cows from the Mairns and sheep from Caithness. We'll stall the herds in the Sheelings of Rannach. These Sheelings of Rannach were the aforementioned summer pastures of the Black Mount, hence the name of the enormous Corba, or Corrie of the Cows, between the Stopgavar Massif and the White Corries. If the owners of stolen cattle were in pursuit, the Macdonalds would instead hide the animals in Kurgaval, or Corrie of the Booty, a secret hanging valley on Bitchin Nambian. And so to the rap sheet. Now for brevity, these are just the most notable of the McKeon's exploits. It should also be borne in mind that these are just the ones we know about. In 1563, various MacDonald branches including McKeon actually assisted the Campbells as paramilitaries in clearing East Rannoch of MacGregors, delivering the MacGregors leader to be beheaded at Finlarig. Yep, really. Sometimes money spoke louder than blood, or honour. 1583 saw the second, and this time successful, raid on Mad Colin Campbell of Megarney in Glen Lyon. We covered the first attempted raid on Mad Colin by the McDonalds in our episode Twin Peaks from series one. 
In 1587, the Scottish Parliament issued legislation known as the General Band. This declared that Highland chieftains were responsible for their entire family or clan's behaviour. This meant very little in real terms to those in the Highlands, but to the Sassanach Lowlanders, this provided legal pretext for retribution against those deemed politically undesirable. In 1591, the eighth Mickian chief stole cows from Perthshire, Argyll, John Drummond of Blair and Macaulay of Edinampel. In 1609, the Macians committed theft and murder against the rival Stuarts of Appin. For this, letters of fire and sword were issued against Macian. Now, letters of fire and sword were pretty much what they sound like, royal edicts to kill and burn the holdings of the clan in question. But because a it was easier and b the Scottish Parliament had no standing army of its own to carry this out, the letters would enable the victims of the crime to exact punishment on their aggressors. Accordingly, the Stuarts beheaded McKeon and his brother and carried their heads off in a barrel. In 1644, the McKeons joined the Earl of Montrose's clan army in support of Charles I after the Highlanders' victory at Inverary. The Campbells gave chase, but Montrose's host met them at the infamous Battle of Inverlochy, which we briefly touched upon in Rise of the Campbells, driving them into Loch Linney in the Campbells' worst ever defeat. In 1645, the Macians, Keppoch, McNabs and McGregors raided Bredalban, murdering every man at arms, burning houses and crops, and even carried away the baptismal font from Kenmore Kirk which seems a bit much. The main victims here, however, weren't Campbells who could afford new cows, but the, quote, many poor people who were burned and spoiled and have nothing to live on. The Lord of Glenorchy had to borrow the enormous sum of £5,000 from Parliament to buy food and seeds for his tenants that spring. In 1646, McKeon and Keppoch heard that there was a Campbell Menzies wedding party at Finladdig Castle in Killen. It was a fair bet that the celebrants would have whiskey in their heads. The Macdonalds raided their cattle, but even with whiskey in their heads, the Campbells pursued them and a bloody battle ensued, ending in stalemate and presumably some rotten hangovers. In 1655, McKeon and Keppoch raided Cashley and Glenlyon, burning byres and seizing cattle. A young girl called McNee was somehow carried away with the cattle as the Macdonalds retreated along Glenlyon. At Glenmerran, which again we visited in Over the Wall, she broke the legs of some of the cattle, holding up the retreat so that the Cashley men could catch up. A bloody skirmish ensued, in which Miss McNee was slain, but many of the cows were recovered and the Macdonalds went home with little to show for their outing. For over two centuries following this event, the women of Bredalban would sing the following song to the children. The words were meant to be that of McNee's. Colin's cows of my heart. John's cows are so dear. They'll give milk on the heather with nothing to fear. Colin's cows of my heart, Colin's cows of my love, like the wing of a moorhen, brown speckled above. These were the actions of the twelfth chief, Alistair Machian. The cows that he had attempted to steal were those of Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon. 1678 was the year of the Highland Host. 4,500 clansmen marched into southwest Scotland to gently encourage Covenanters to accept episcopy. In plain language, this meant settling old scores through wholesale looting and pillaging of Campbell lands. This Highland host stole pretty much everything that could be carried away, but there were no deaths and, crucially, no McDonald's among the host. Coincidence? Maybe. However, this didn't stop Lowlanders from assuming that the McKeons were in the front line of this monstrous regiment. In 1681, 
the Campbells of Argyle suffered a devastating blow when the Earl of Argyle was tried for treason and sentenced to death for opposing the Test Act of that year. As we saw in Inglorious Revolutions, this was a peacekeeping edict from a reluctant Charles II that banned Catholics from taking British public office. A sizeable contingent of Highlanders sympathetic to the Stuarts and led by Murray of Athol were sent to secure Argyle's lands. This did include the Macdonalds, and again this quickly turned into a free-for-all, the clansmen stealing everything that wasn't nailed down and gutting the Campbell lands with relish. This Year of the Athol Men would long be remembered in the Lowlands as an example of the growing, intolerable menace of the Gaeltach. So disastrous was Argyll's fall that the Campbell hegemony seemed briefly in danger of falling apart, but not for long. 1689 saw McKeon and Keppoch scouring of Glen Lyon after the final Jacobite war council at Blair Castle as again we saw in Inglorious Revolutions. The once noble men of Glencoe had fallen a long way since their fabled kin had ruled the western seaboard in peace and honour. No longer did these Macdonalds act as a unifying force for stability in the Glens, instead they antagonised the other clans, looting, burning and murdering seemingly indiscriminately on the increasingly tenuous pretext of defending Highland culture from the rising Campbell hegemony. In reality, however, they were actively helping to undermine the Highland cause and accelerate the destruction of Gallic culture and society in Scotland, providing those who sought the annihilation of the Gaeltich with an enormous stockpile of political and rhetorical ammunition. While they had often been seen off in skirmishes on the foray, the Machaeans had managed, through guile, cunning and no little luck, to avoid any serious reckoning for their increasingly lengthy rap sheet of theft, fire raising and, let's be honest, cold blooded murder. As we've seen at Glen Marin, this wasn't limited to men at arms, that is, men of fighting age, but also on occasion to women and children. It wasn't uncommon for women perceived as of Campbell stock or just tenants of Campbell lands to have their hair shorn off by broadsword as a message. We know from Rise of the Campbells that the vast majority of those tenanted on the newly Campbell lands were in fact not Campbells. There's no getting away from the fact that the Machaeans would have known this all too well given that they themselves were tenants of the Campbells and, as mentioned, would already have been hunted down like the MacGregors if it had been more convenient to do so. This shows how cynical the McKeon rationale for their actions really was. This wasn't a fight for freedom against an oppressor, but a particularly gratuitous example of punching downward. In real terms, the Machaeans were engaged in opportunistic bullying of those under similar oppression. Again, the Campbell victims, supposedly the targets of these raids, would often be able to afford to replace what the Highlanders had taken from them, but the vastly poorer subtenants of the land faced unimaginable hardship as a result. Without their livestock, many tenants would die during the winter, and again, the Machaeans would have been keenly aware of this. There could be no justification for how far the herd Widifus had taken their grievance against the Campbells, and in the lowlands, the appetite for retribution was reaching boiling point. The aforementioned Alexander or Alistair MacDonald was the twelfth chief of the McKeans. Tall, red-haired and a commanding presence in his prime, by now he was an old man, still proud and fierce in will if not in combat. He was also, even to his allies, a needy, irritating nuisance and to his clansmen an increasing liability. 
Glencoe is no place for agriculture and McKeon's reliance on cattle theft was running the clan into debt, with rent being missed and little means of paying it. This left the McKeons heavily compromised in a legal and practical sense. They owed money to the Campbells and therefore with the Campbells now royal lieutenants to the crown. Those who've seen Inglorious Revolutions will know that this meant the incestuous, double-bottomed British monarchy of William of Orange and Mary Stuart, neither of whom had any interest in Scotland and thus delegated military operations there to their Highland lieutenants, such as the Campbells. There was also the problem that Campbells now occupied key positions of high government. This allowed the family to exert faceless authority over matters of state in Scotland, their unseen political manoeuvring a much safer and more efficient means of control than getting one's hands dirty in combat. When James II and VII was replaced by William of Orange, the Campbells shamelessly changed their coats and worked for the new regime, attaining significant power and influence as a result. The chief political advocates of William were the Whigs, a centrist party that counted many Campbells among its membership. The McKeons and many other Highland clans, however, most certainly did not support William of Orange, and for this they were deemed traitors and rebels by the new establishment. When the McKeons joined their Macdonald brethren to fight for King James at the Battle of Killiecrankie, they were declaring themselves Jacobites, while their brazen raiding had turned many Highlanders against them and filled the moneyed lowland elites with a broiling resentment at the threat to their capital. On paper, these are the two main motivations for the Glencoe massacre. But why did the Macdonalds support the Stuarts? We know that the Stuart dynasty had schemed against the Lord of the Isles and eventually divided up the Riach Nan Yellen among their Highland cronies. By the 1600s, they were kings of Britain and cared little for the inhabitants of the Highlands beyond their potential military utility. On the face of it, the Macdonalds should have had no love for these imperialist, authoritarian despots. Not for the first time, the short answer is ambition and opportunity. Like their eyebrow-raising mercenary work for the Campbells, the Macdonalds saw in the King's cause a chance to regain some of their lost power, or failing that, a fat payday. The Campbells paid handsomely for delivery of the MacGregors to Finlaric, and the spoils of Glen Lyon were more than ample recompense for their service in the Jacobite Rising of 1689. Whatever their reasons, the fact was that the McKeons of Glencoe were now enemies of the state, known Jacobites, and therefore what in modern parlance would be termed domestic terrorists. To their peers, that is the other Highland clans, the Macdonald's social credit from the Lords of the Isles era had long run out, and McKeon was now seen as an unseemly embarrassment. By now, he was a man of few friends, and a veritable legion of enemies. The most intelligent and powerful of these was John Dalrymple, otherwise known as the Master of Stair, who now formulated a plan of revenge against the Children of the Heather, enabled by William of Orange, facilitated by Campbell ministers, and this is the most insidious part, to be carried out by Highlanders themselves. Next time, in the penultimate chapter of our quest to understand the Glencoe Massacre, we'll look at the dangerous gamble of the Earl of Breadalbane, the dark manoeuvres of the Master of Stair, and the trials of Major John Hill at the Black Garrison of Inverlochy. Thanks for watching. Really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, hit like and subscribe and click the bell icon to see new episodes as soon as they arrive. Next time, we continue our Glencoe Odyssey with the very highest point of all, Bichinambian, King of the Hill. Until then, 
enjoy your adventures. <laughs>